Good afternoon or good morning or evening, depending on where you're joining from Facebook or YouTube. I'm Roy, a curatorial assistant from National Gallery Singapore and part of the curatorial team for the ongoing exhibition Living Pictures Photography in Southeast Asia, which runs from now to 20th of August this year. Welcome to this online lecture and conversation with Susie Prochke. A bit of an introduction, Susie is Associate Professor in History in Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia, and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow for the project Decolonization and Photography in Southeast Asia, Histories and Legacies. She is author of the prize-winning book, Photographic Subjects, Monarchy and Visual Culture in Colonial Indonesia, published in Manchester University Press in 2019 as well as Images of the Tropics, Environment and Visual Culture in Colonial Indonesia, published in 2011, and editor of Photography, Modernity and the Governed in Late Colonial Indonesia, published in 2015, and with Ton van Berg, uh, Modern Times in Southeast Asia, circa 1920s to 1970s, published in 2018. Today's discussion will explore the visual politics of war photography in Southeast Asia, with particular reference to the Indonesian National Revolution of 1945 to 1949. As we might know throughout history, photography has been a powerful medium for communication and social exchange. During times of conflict, soldiers and civilians alike have used photography as a way to stay connected with loved ones and to document the events of war. However, as this lecture and discussion will re reveal, the act of taking and sharing such photographs raises complex questions about the ethics of spectatorship, particularly in the context of decolonization. Susie, who draws on her research into Dutch amateur photographers active during the Indonesian National Revolution, will examine how these photographs became objects of recognition, contestation, and mourning. She will explore how these images expose the ways in which we construct narratives about difficult pasts and how they continue to be reclaimed and reassessed by audiences today. Today's discussion is particularly timely given the ongoing debates surrounding decolonization and the ways in which difficult pasts are remembered and memorialized. We hope that by examining the visual politics of war photography in Southeast Asia, we can gain a deeper understanding of the complex and often contested histories of the region. It is worth adding that Susie's latest research aligns with the ongoing Living Pictures exhibition at the gallery, given its focus on cultural and political history of Southeast Asia and its particular interest in the visual and material cultures of colonialism and decolonization. The exhibition itself showcases the works of photographers working in the region from the 19th century to the present day, and reveals the many roles that photographs have played in imperialism and nationalism, in constructing and asserting modernities, and in challenging class and gender hierarchies. Many of the photographers in this show have used the medium to influence our vision of Southeast Asia, while others have questioned photography's impact on our perception. What does photography make visible, and what does it leave out? These are the questions that Living Pictures seeks to answer. So as we delve into today's discussion, it will be good to consider the power of photography and what it can do. What do these images shape our understanding of the world and how do they continue to be reclaimed and reassessed by audiences today? With that in mind, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Suzy Prochki. Suzy, please. Thanks so much, Roy, and thank you to the National Gallery of Singapore for inviting me to give this lecture on an aspect of the wonderful Living Pictures exhibition. I just want to acknowledge, to begin with, that I'm speaking to you today from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people in Nam or Melbourne, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. What I'm going to discuss today is photographs of war and revolution in Indonesia and Vietnam, which are also a major focus of the in real life section of the Living Pictures exhibition, 
a section that looks at the period between the 1950s and 1970s, when much of Southeast Asia is going through a process of decolonization in Indonesia, the Federation of Malaya, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos or Laos. This process involved armed conflicts of civil war and sometimes also revolutions against former European colonizers in the context of an emerging Cold War, which was actually very hot in Southeast Asia. In Indonesia, independence from the Netherlands, which had been a colonial power in parts of the archipelago for 350 years, was declared on 17 August 1945, two days after the capitulation of Japan to Allied forces. But independence was not gained until the 27th of December 1949, after a long and bloody conflict that involved the largest ever deployment of military forces by the Netherlands and killed some 100,000 Indonesians. It was an anti-colonial revolution, but there were also social revolutions and Islamist and communist uprisings challenging for supremacy against the nationalist regime in Indonesia. In Indochina, or what is now Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia, conflict broke out in December 1946 between French forces and the Viet Minh or the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, a little more than a year after Ho Chi Minh proclaimed an independent republic in the north of the country. The first Indochina war ended with a French defeat and withdrawal in August 1954. More than a million soldiers and civilians had already died during this part of the conflict, which involved into the second Indochina war in 1955, when the Republic of South Vietnam, backed by the United States and its allies, sought to maintain its independence from North Vietnamese forces, the National Liberation Front, or Viet Cong, and the People's Army of Vietnam. The Truong Son Trail, or the Ho Chi Minh Trail, the major supply network connecting North Vietnam to insurgents in the South, ran through Laos and Cambodia and therefore drew these countries into the conflict, which ended in 1975 when North and South Vietnam were um, reunified and the US withdrew. I'll be talking about press photography from the revolutions in Indonesia and Indochina, which are um, the, the main focus of the um, in real life section that looks at war uh, in the Living Pictures exhibition. Some of these photos that you'll see if you go and look at the exhibition or um, have a look at the catalogue are um, uh, have become truly iconic. Um, they're instantly recognisable to millions of people around the world for capturing significant political moments and the brutal hor horrors of war, and I'll be showing some of those later. I'll talk about these photographs not as artworks, but as propaganda and acts of witnessing. That is, as images produced with a political agenda in mind to shape particular perspectives of war that tend to uphold the righteousness of one side and the wickedness of another through framing and censorship. And I'll also look at them as acts that have become associated very much with the moral work of the heroic photojournalist who puts his and in this period, it's always a he, largely because it was only men who could be who could be embedded with military units, um, who put his life and liberty at risk to photograph the sacrifices and injustices of war. The framework of seeing the photojournalist as a poignant and heroic figure, and then mediating the suffering of others as a moral calling was created by a number of intersecting cultural and technological factors. The explosion of photography as a mass media product very, was quite well established by the mid 20th century. Um, photographs were available for consumption by a global audience in newspapers, journals, and magazines. Um, then there is the emergence of the photojournalist embedded with military units and therefore promising to give home fronts the view that was like that of a soldier serving on the front line. There's also the notion that news photographs should have qualities that move a mass ideal public emotionally, aesthetically and politically. And the phenomenon of journalists being rewarded for their efforts with um, things like the Pulitzer Prize um, and uh, and of that giving them fame and glory 
which um, we'll get back to that topic later. These last points, of course, raise the spectre of the commercial and reputational gain that photojournalists stand to accrue from their work, which somewhat undermines the purity of the moral calling that they're associated with, and the notion that audiences might be entertained by images of war and the suffering of others. For decades, from Susan Sontag in the 1970s to Susan Crane in the 2000s, theorists and historians have questioned the link between photography's ability to move audiences to action and the danger of images having a numbing effect, producing a so-called compassion fatigue. As Susan Crane wrote in a well-known 2008 essay called Choosing Not to Look, which was not about photojournalism per se, but about representations of the Holocaust. Quote, the act of making people see is beginning to take the place of making people do. Um, she quotes from Barbie Zelizer there and goes on to say, witnessing then becomes the quintessential ethical event of the 20th century and supplants any other response, including the political, unquote. To complicate the views of press photographers, I'm going to insert some discussion of the other important photographers of war in the mid 20th century, the amateur frontline soldier photographer. He is the product of technological innovations that mean um, that by the 1940s, soldiers could carry small portable cameras and develop prints from rolls of film at local studios in Southeast Asia or by post back wherever their home front was. In, um, in Europe. For the Indonesian War of Independence, the largest archive of these photographs came from the Dutch side. There are tens of thousands of photographs in Dutch archives that have been deposited by veterans and their families. The vast majority of them still undigitized objects in their original forms. And I'll be talking about some of those here as a counterpoint to Indonesian and Vietnamese press photographs and also to reflect critically on how propaganda and witnessing is created in war by photographers with very different aims and audiences. The Indonesian Press Photo Service or IPOS There we are. Uh oh. The right so um, IPOS was founded by Franz and Alex Mendor and the Umbas brothers in Jakarta. Their photographs were published in Indonesian newspapers and pamphlets throughout the revolution. Some of what survives of the negatives and prints are now held at UNRI, the Arsip Nacional Republic Indonesia. Some were taken as loot by Dutch intelligence services, um, but many have been lost. So. What uh, exists now is precious. Perhaps none more so than this photograph that you're looking at now, which has become iconic, um, showing the first president of the Republic of Indonesia and the leader of the Indonesian National Party, Sukarno, reading out the proclamasi or Declaration of Indonesian Independence. Um, the photograph was taken by Franz Mendel with his Leica, and then the negatives were buried in a metal box in his backyard. It wasn't published until six months later in February 1946 in the nationalist paper Merdeka. That series remains the only known photographs of the founding of the Republic. Sorry, I'm just waiting for the image to change. There we go, sorry about the delay. What the IPOS photographers captured in the following years was the support of the population for their leaders and the mass spectacle of Indonesians claiming public space as citizens of a nation fighting for its independence. So pictures like this one, which is after the transfer of sovereignty um, has happened on the Medan Merdeka across from the former Governor General's Palace, renamed the Istana Merdeka. Um, after Indonesian independence. 
Um, here's another picture showing um, General Sudirman's uh, guards entering Jakarta during um, ceasefire negotiations with the Dutch, and you can see um, the crowds around these um, jeeps, um, including um, nicely dressed, very kempt children, which is a topic that I will get back to um, in a moment. These topics are represented in quite comparable ways, as you can see, by international press photographers, like notably the Frenchman Henri Cartier-Bresson, who was married to Ratna Mohini, a local-born Indo-European woman known as a Javanese dancer. Um, Cartier-Bresson was working for Life magazine at the time and was, of course, also one of the founders of the co-op Magnum Photos together with Robert Kappa, George Roger and David Seymour in 1947. So his photographs, um, which are very uplifting, um, positive photographs are very similar in subject matter and in tone to the Ipos photographs. And of course, he was reaching um, an international audience. The Ipos photographers were not just interested in showing the relationship between Republican politicians and the people, they were also interested in the role of diplomacy in forging Indonesian independence, and the international negotiations that Indonesian politicians needed to participate in order to achieve that. These photo photographs were important for demonstrating the legitimacy of the Republican government and its ability to function on an international stage, um, but also the international solidarity that Indonesia's fight for independence attracted. In the period between August 45 and December 49, as I've already mentioned, anti-colonial revolutions had broken out in British Malaya and French Indochina, and India and Pakistan had gained their independence from British rule as a result of strong independence movements. Decolonization movements, many of them revolutionary, were also sweeping Africa. These convulsions led to lasting political conversations about a new post-colonial world order that Indonesia took a leading role in at the Bandung Conference in 1955. Um, what's happening in this photograph, an Ipos photograph, um, is that that should say Sultan Shahir, um, the Prime Minister of the Republic, is greeting um, the returned um, Indonesian uh, sailors who um, had protested against being forced to work on Dutch ships that were bound for Indonesia to, to arm Dutch forces. And um, they were assisted with getting back to um, uh, Indonesia by um, Australian um, authorities. Just changing the image, waiting a moment. In Australia, there were trade union movements in solidarity with Indonesian sailors who refused to service those Dutch ships that were going back to Indonesia. These protests were the subject of the well-known contemporary film by Joris Evans, Indonesia Calling, and the Australian historian Heather Goodall's recent book on the subject, Beyond Borders, shows how important the solidarity was between Indonesian and Indian seamen in Australia who were equally committed to independence from British colonial rule on the subcontinent and saw the plight of Indonesia and India as springing from the same source, European imperialism. To this day, the Dutch government does not recognise Indonesian independence as having begun on the day Indonesians celebrated, 17 August 1945. Instead, the Netherlands recognises the date of the rather Pacific sounding transfer of sovereignty on 27 November, December 1949, which was a legal and ceremonial affair carried out in The Hague. As Ariel Harianto has argued, it would be a travesty, however, not to recognise the enormous effort across more than four years of war and concerted international political cooperation with allies in fora like the United Nations that brought about the Dutch surrender of sovereignty. So the EPOS photographs and those of press photographers in places like Australia are a reminder of the many political fronts on which the Indonesian National Revolution was fought and won. When it came to representing the revolution as a conflict, however, the EPOS photographs were quite sanitised. 
They didn't show active combat scenes. And although there are a few photographs of Sukarno visiting wounded fighters in hospital, by and large, they preferred to avoid Indonesian casualties. This is where um, photographs from the Second Indochina War are quite different. And it's not for technological reasons, despite the 20 year time difference. So these photographs um, by uh, photographers like Le Min Truong um, uh, were made by um, photographers carrying their chemicals and equipment with them in difficult conditions. And uh, Truong washed his prints in streams at night to develop them. The Ipos photographs uh, can be seen by comparison as endorsed by a nationalist regime keen to shore up its political legitimacy and simplify the internecine, complex, uh, the internecine conflicts that were also part of the Indonesian National Revolution. As T. Fu has argued, the Second Indonesia, Indochina War changed the way scholars and arguably the public viewed the relationship between photography and revolution. This was a conflict fought after the advent of television and recognised as a civil war from the outset. Tifu's new book, Warring Visions, explains how photographers from North and South Vietnam developed socialist ways of seeing, which are quite different from, and in many ways opposed to the images known in the West by press photographers and embedded American military photographers. Theirs were ways of seeing that arose from the photographer's political aspirations, socialist forms of nationalism, and from their press editor's goals of reaching mass audiences, as well as, crucially, international communist bloc allies. So um, in this photograph, you can see um, uh, soldiers uh, taking the trail uh, through the mountains. Um, and this photograph by Rohan Khan, Oh, I'm sorry, I should have said uh, in the last image. Sorry, it doesn't matter. You, you were looking at it before. So Le Min Truong was a North Vietnamese photographer. He began his career um, after he was wounded in the first Indochina War, which of course was against the French, and then worked as a war correspondent for the Liberation News Agency. He became, for his, he became famous for his photographs of the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail, which supplied the North Vietnamese Army or Viet Cong and People's Army of Vietnam troops fighting in the south. So he accompanied those troops through the, the, on that difficult trail. Boan Khan also traveled with the um, guerrilla units of the North Vietnamese Army in South Vietnam in the 60s and 70s. And here's one of his very well-known photographs. He started out making propaganda posters and when he turned to photography, staged um, pop-up exhibitions for the communities he was working with. Like Le Min Truong, he developed his prints on site in difficult circumstances. So he photographed uh, the mobile medical clinics working in the Uman forest um, during the devastating defoliation campaigns or napalm bombings of the US military. Um, like this photograph showing medics working knee deep in swamp water to remove shrapnel from a patient. He also photographed children attending school in the forest women taking political classes, and women working as spies in US territory. So he was very much um, embedded with the people who were fighting for um, a communist uh, future um, in the South as well as um, in the North. The... Ipos photographs, of course, also showed the heroes of the revolution. So this is back to Indonesia, the young people who were taking up arms to fight. And they did it in group photographs like this one that showed the optimism and idealism driving these youths. Again, um, photographers like Cartier Bresson made similarly cheerful photographs of uh, Pemudas or youths um, around the same time. 
Hippos also showed the impact of the Dutch occupation in illuminating ways, like this photograph that captures the release of political prisoners to their relatives and friends. Tens of thousands of Indonesians were taken prisoner at some stage or another by Dutch soldiers or authorities during the revolution. And this photograph shows that, even if it appears as a very orderly resolution to that widespread practice. Now, these Ipos photographs did not make it into the Dutch press. Um, those same scenes that I've just been showing you, the youth who joined the revolution and the taking of prisoners were represented in very different ways by Dutch press photographers, and I'll get to those in a moment. The Dutch photographs were, of course, most concerned with visual evidence of their own side's bravery and fortitude, and with painting the enemy as terrorists and savages, or as reckless toward the suffering of Indonesian civilians. This last theme was also taken up with great enthusiasm by amateur soldier photographers on the front line who really expanded in far more graphic detail on the often quite sanitised views of press photographers. So here is how um, amateur soldier photographers represented the heroes of the revolution, quite different to the Ipos view. When Indonesian soldiers were captured by the Dutch, they were often shown in a pitiable and disorganised state, not in proper uniforms, barely recognisable as combatants, which was also, of course, a huge source of paranoia for Dutch soldiers in what was a guerrilla war, that it was difficult to distinguish civilian from combatant. Um, and Dutch propaganda authorities and soldiers often infantilised Indonesian fighters, saying they were very young, barely children. They were portrayed as crazed and criminal youths, waging a disorder emptied of its political content and international intellectual foundations, which were grounded in criticisms of colonialism and um, in global and regional movements and international movements like Marxism and communism and in the process of being um, codified by international organisations like the United Nations and the Red Cross, um, which upheld um, the United Nations and the Atlantic Charter, of course, notionally upheld the right of nations to their own sovereignty and independence. Changing slides again, just bear with me. There we go. This photograph um, was from the personal album of Jakob Nieuwenhuizen, who was a lieutenant in the Navy and head of MARID, the Naval Intelligence Service. Um, it's typical of the kinds of images that Dutch intelligence and information services like to gather for their own records, as well as for international observers, to show the terrible state of civilian populations that Dutch forces were supposedly rescuing. So this is an image that was taken um, in Kamal, Madura in 1948 or 47, um, showing children who'd gone blind through um, malnutrition and you can see they're dressed in rags. Um, uh, old women are, are, are um, women and children are, are clearly um, suffering from the combined effects there of the Japanese occupation. But also the argument of these photographs is that these civilians were being neglected by um, the Republican government that was now proclaiming um, to be fighting for independence. This image by Bob van Dijk, who was an embedded photographer with um, the Dutch armed forces, was uh, published, um, this is his print, um, from his uh, personal archive, but it was also published in Dutch um, periodicals in the late 1940s. And it shows a soldier handing out his own rations, in this case biscuits, to Indonesian civilians, an image uh, topic that is replicated endlessly by amateur soldier photographers in their private albums, the view of soldiers feeding Indonesian civilians out of their own um, rations. So far, I've shown a mix of press and private photographs taken by Dutch soldiers or embedded photographers, and I've talked about the ways that they're similar to each other. But in some important ways, Dutch amateur and 
press photographs differed mark markedly, and that was in the depiction of violence. So here is an image that press photog photographers sometimes showed, although normally in a very careful, sanitized way, but that recurs over and over in the private collections of Dutch veterans. It shows the taking of prisoners, which I argue is the trophy photograph of Dutch forces during the Indonesian National Revolution. It arose from the conditions of a counterinsurgency where Dutch military units claimed large territories that they could not possibly police and sought to control them by conducting patrols, sweeping villages of their male populations and conducting so-called cleansing operations of searches and interrogations and taking people prisoner to flush out information and combatants. It was during operations like these that a vast amount of indiscriminate or extreme violence occurred, according to historians like Remy Limbach, particularly when intelligence units were involved. These photographs survive in large numbers because for ordinary Dutch soldiers, they represented the success of operations that were otherwise very frustrating and frightening for them. In situations where danger and paranoia prevailed, they show the taking of human trophies, but only up to the point where it was acceptable to show what was happening. Um, occasionally, you get to see some of the things that happened afterwards. So these are, this is one of two very famous, now notorious photographs taken by a Dutch soldier called uh, Jacobus Ridderhof. They were found in his personal um, album. So it's in the, the collections of amateur frontline soldier photographers that we see evidence of what Dutch political and military authorities were long reluctant to acknowledge, and that is that the Dutch were perpetrators of extreme violence and war crimes. So this shows um, a ditch um, with bodies of Indonesians who were taken prisoner and murdered, um, uh, one of many summary executions that um, Dutch forces carried out throughout the revolution. It was ordinary soldiers who captured illicit scenes like this, um, and they've begun, they began to be rediscovered in personal photograph collections and published in Dutch media outlets about a decade ago as part of a re-examination of the nature of the Dutch war in Indonesia. For the second Indochina war, these sorts of images were provided by photographers for the international media and foreign press agencies. So examples in the Living Pictures exhibition of this photograph which I think every adult um, probably um, has seen in their life at some point, um, this one by Nick Utt, and the other one that I'll show you in, in a moment by Eddie Adams called The Execution. So Nick Utt's photograph shows the immediate effect of a napalm bombing by the South Vietnamese Air Force intending to target a communist stronghold, um, but they ended up hitting a civilian population in the village of Trung Bam. The little girl in the centre of the picture, Fanti Kim Fok, tore off her burning, uh, her burning clothes to protect her skin, and but still suffered from serious burns. Nick uh, took her to hospital and she survived, and they remained in contact um, throughout the rest of, they have remained in contact throughout the rest of their lives. The other children around her are her brothers and cousins, there is another image taken by Art that shows a grandmother holding a badly burned toddler who was her grand grandson, and he died as a consequence of his injuries. Um, Eddie Adams' photographs shows the captain in the Viet Cong, Nguyen Van Lem, at the moment of his execution in the street in Saigon by General Nguyen Nhoc Luan of the Republic of Vietnam during the Tet Offensive in 1968. Lem had been accused of murdering a South Vietnamese Lieutenant Colonel and his family. Eddie Adams later said he thought he was going to be capturing a scene of uh, intimidation and had not expected the shooting to happen. He just happened to pull the trigger on his camera um, at the right time. So he inadvertently captured a war crime 
for which Loan, who fled to the US after the war, um, was never uh, prosecuted. Both these photographs have generated hundreds of thousands of words about the effect they had on the subjects, the people photographed in them, whose lives were shaped by these moments in ways that they personally preferred to leave behind in many ways. And this is a widespread phenomenon when um, Western press photographers photograph the suffering of, um, of people in uh, war or famine or um, other uh, situations that the subjects, when they survive, often feel trapped in that moment of, of their um, suffering and, and degradation and that the photographers uh, become very famous, perhaps notorious for those images, but that the world loses interest in all of the processes and the politics and the personal struggle that it took for those people who are pictured in the photographs to survive. Um, so that's one of the subjects that is um, that sort of speaks to the ethics of spectatorship, I suppose, and what happens when we become enthralled to these um, moments of, of suffering. Um, scholars have also talked about the effect of these photographs from the Vietnam War on public opinion in the US in particular. The Vietnam War was the first so-called television war broadcast daily into the homes of American audiences. In fact, the aftermath of the napalm bombing that Nick Up captured in 1972 was also filmed for television. But it's these still photographs that have become the enduring image of the war over the long term. And they have often been credited with turning the tide of American public opinion against the war in the context of massive protests against conscription and a countercultural critique of establishment politics. It's more accurate to say that it's really only in hindsight that these images have become associated with what Americans, Americans particularly came to see as an unwinnable war, a war that they lost in 1975. And that's interesting because it's quite opposed to how, for example, South Vietnamese see these pictures and that conflict and how the South Vietnamese diaspora continues to see this today, as shown by historians like Natalie Nguyen, taking oral histories from communities who started out as refugees from the war in cities like Melbourne, which has one of the larger populations of South Vietnamese refugees and their descendants in the world. For the case of Indonesia, there are no similar atrocity photographs taken by international press photographers that made the revolution and Dutch counterinsurgency notorious at the time of the conflict. Instead, it is long after that um, photographs that were taken by amateur soldier photographers have come to define this war as being one characterised by atrocities on both sides, the Indonesian and the Dutch side. Those amateur photographs were not made with the intention of notifying a critical Dutch or Indonesian or international audience of the horrors of war. The motives behind those images are more complex and often difficult to retrieve. They function sometimes, frankly, as trophy photographs meant to celebrate violence, but in an environment where it was not legal or politically or socially acceptable to publicise that violence. And that is where photographs that were taken by Dutch soldiers during the 40s, during the Indonesian National Revolution, are very different from photographs from 50 years earlier, from, for example, the Dutch war subjugation of Aceh, or of South Bali, which also produced um, horrific massacres that were photographed and that circulated in um, Dutch public realms quite publicly and that were meant to be um, evidence of the Dutch having won those battles. By the 40s, it was no longer acceptable um, for those sorts of images to be shown, but they were still being made and they were circulating in private circles as trophy photographs. So this photograph was made by J.A. Frucht, and I'm going to talk about it, the original black and white there and the colorized one. And I'll talk about those two in a minute. Um, Dutch 
press photographers generally avoided these um, uh, controversial images. And in fact, um, not these images, the one that I showed you, the ones that I showed you um, earlier of summary executions and and of the, um, the, the atrocities that happened during the revolution, they were in fact actively censored by Dutch press agencies during the war. What the Dutch press photographers did show were um, very different perspectives to the ones that were shown by the Indonesian photographers in Ipos. Um, the Indonesian photographers did not represent, for example, the mass displacement of civilian populations. They didn't show food shortages. They didn't show clothing shortages and the lack of medicine. So the Dutch press photographers showed the terrible impact of the war on Indonesian civilians. And that was something that the EPOS photographers did not show. So things like this image of a woman waiting in line for um, Red Cross provisions. So these images were taken by propaganda photographers, men like J.A. Fucht, who were embedded in Dutch military units and given the explicit task of providing visual content that would confirm the official narrative of the police action. Ipos photographs did not delve into things like this, nor did they look at the social revolutions that saw the murder of many of Indonesia's royal families and the competing visions for an independent nation that was claimed not just by nationalists, but also by communists, Islamists, and various provincial and regional separatist movements. Some of those movements were ruthlessly put down by Republican forces, such as the communist Madion uprising of 1948, in which at least 10,000 Indonesians were killed, and in a time when the press in Yogyakarta, the Republican seat of government, was censored, Ipos did not show the massacre of Chinese Indonesians or Indo-Europeans or other groups who were regarded as historic collaborators with the Dutch or as ethnic outsiders who needed to be expelled from the emerging nation. Photographs of those aspects of the Indonesian National Revolution were carefully made and collected by Dutch intelligence services and press photographers and frontline soldier photographers. And they were circulated to foreign governments, particularly to the United States and the Red Cross. And they circulated among ordinary soldiers and were printed in military and veterans publications in the Netherlands for decades after the war. These sorts of images, the ones that you're seeing now, have contributed to a narrative of the Dutch war in Indonesia as a humanitarian intervention. Not, a, not just a police action to restore order. And this counter narrative of a just war helps explain the endurance of resistance in the Netherlands to the notion that the Dutch were also perpetrators of violence and atrocity, as well as the Indonesian um, forces against uh, their own people. And that revisionist turn in the Netherlands has been taken seriously only in the last couple of decades, perhaps particularly in the last 10 years. And it's now officially recognised as of February last year when the Dutch government under Premier Mark Rutte apologised to the Republic of Indonesia for extreme violence. Now, the colour photograph here was produced by an Indonesian colourizer, and there's quite a boom of this happening um, on social media, in particular on Instagram, on Facebook and on Twitter, where um, Indonesian colourizers are taking these photographs that were produced, interestingly, by Dutch propaganda photographers during the revolution and adding colour to them and putting them on social media and getting a response from an audience. So they often use um, photographs that were taken by people like Frucht, who worked for MAMSVO, which is the acronym for the um, information service of the Marine Brigade, or also by DLC, which is the Dutch acronym for the Service for Army Contacts, which is also a propaganda and intelligence organisation. These images typically show the combined effects of the Japanese occupation of the Netherlands East Indies in World War II from 1942 to 5, and the conflict that then begins with the Declaration of Independence. These are by no means fictive images, but they conveniently ignore the role of Dutch forces in blockading ports and Republican-held areas, which contributes to shortages of food, clothing and medicine. Um, professional and amateur soldier photographers alike preferred to attribute civilian suffering to the perceived atrocities of neglect of the Republican regime in ways that conformed the official Dutch narrative of police actions, which I've already talked about, which I've already spoken about. 
So this text is from the original um, Twitter post by Sargeno Colorization. And um, you can see that Frucht is characterised as a combat correspondent. Now, that's a rather neutral term for a propaganda photographer. But Indonesian Twitter users overwhelmingly responded to this um, colorized photograph of a malnourished Indonesian woman, woman in ways that assumed her suffering was caused by Dutch aggression or the Japanese occupation. Another striking response to similar photographs on social media um, was that viewers connected revolution era suffering with present day problems in Indonesia. In the first half of 2022, surging prices and shortages of cooking oil due to supply disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russian invasion of Ukraine made headlines. The Indonesian government's attempt under President Joko Widodo to regulate domestic supplies by implementing an export ban in April that year was controversial, especially among producers and not least because it failed. Social media users quickly drew links between visual representations of re revolution era deprivations and the contemporary crisis, with several commenting on the theme of history repeating itself, literally, Sajara Turulang Kumbali. Threads responding to colorized photographs like this one corroborate Karen Strassler's theorization of the political eventfulness of images that recirculate on Indonesian social media. An anthropologist, Strassler sees photographs as, quote, events that happen rather than things that move in a polyphonic and complexly mediated public sphere. Her approach can explain how perspectives that take for granted the role of the Dutch's aggressors in many ways compensate for an absence of rich context in furnishing accurate interpretations of the past. Indeed, this photograph that you're looking at is able to exceed its original intent because Indonesian social media uses both see-through colonial propaganda to recognise the violent context in which such images were taken, and they locate the photograph in contemporary national discussions about the unfinished business of decolonisation, or more specifically, the efficacy of post-independence Indonesian governments in securing the welfare of ordinary people. In the Netherlands, by contrast, what we could consider an excess of context an absolute abundance of archival sources had arguably done very little to shift public perspectives on a conflict that was not even framed as a war until relatively recently. So I'm going to finish up with um, two more photographs. Perspective um, by Hugo Wilmer, who was um, also embedded with the Marine Brigade um, and one of the more famous um, um, press photographers of, of this period in the Netherlands. So perspective similarly trumps context in Indonesian social media users' responses to photographs of explicit violence, Dutch violence against Indonesian combatants. So here's one, and here's a photo that's recently been colorized and circulated on social media. Another one by Vilmar. Um, in the lead up to the Ruta government's apology for extreme violence last year, there was a small online boom in circulations of colorized Vilmar photographs, particularly those he took during the Marine Brigade's Operation Quantico in mid-August 1946. This military action, which targeted Indonesian Republican Army strongholds to the west of Surabaya in East Java, was considered a Dutch military success, resulting in 267 enemy deaths 660 arrests with just two Marines lost on the Dutch side. We'd normally call such asymmetric casualties a massacre. Vilmar's photographs showed Dutch soldiers dragging Indonesian combatants by the hair from their hiding places or coercing Indonesian prisoners with firearms, as in the last photograph. Vilmar's superiors deemed these photographs too sensationalist for circulation to the Dutch or international press, and they were thought to have languished in military archives until the 90s when rediscovered by Dutch photo historian Louis Veres. It turns out that some of those photographs um, were seen um, before the 90s, but that is a story for another time. So famous have Vilmar's and other Dutch photographers' images of Dutch brutality and atrocity become over more than a decade of Dutch museum exhibitions, scholarly books, and traditional media reporting that some historians 
have now proclaimed certain types of Dutch violence, such as images of summary ex executions and the taking of prisoners as iconic in public understandings of decolonization. The long and incomplete trajectory of recognition in the Netherlands over a process that's taken more than 70 years is signalled, however, by how discussion of Dutch soldiers as perpetrators has only very lately reached traditional media in the Netherlands, and notably only the left-wing media, where the term was once exclusively associated with Nazis and the German occupation during World War II. Among Indonesian social media users who may not have seen Vilmar's photographs before, the revelatory power of these colorized images has perhaps been less profound than among Dutch audiences because Indonesian perspectives on the Dutch as aggressors pre-exist the evidence the photographs furnish. That's the whole premise on which the concept of revolution against colonial rule was based. Indeed, Indonesian spectators' attention is not particularly focused on Dutch perpetrators who are seen as dirty fighters for the first time. Instead, Indonesian social media users often look at difficult, at different figures in the picture. They look at the prisoners and the casualties of war, among whom they do not see only victims, which is the necessary category for producing a perpetrator, but also heroes and resistance fighters. And I'm going to end on that note, hopefully having shown you um, a variety, just the complexity of perspectives that are uh, given by war photography, not just depending on what side the photographer is on, but also whether those images were intentionally made for um, a public audience or whether they were made for a private audience of soldiers. And then also the complex ways in which those images have taken on new post-colonial meanings for Indonesian and Dutch audiences after decolonization. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Susie, for that insightful lecture on the visual politics of war photography in Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm sure our audience have a lot of questions and comments to share. I've already seen two uh, that uh, some of you have dropped on Facebook or YouTube. Um, yeah, so it's now time for our discussion and Q&A session. Uh, if you have a question or comment, feel free to type in the chat. Uh, we'll try to get in as many questions as possible, but please be patient as we have limited time. Um, just to get us started, I actually have a question for Susie. Um, you know, particularly re relevant are these debates about the indexicality of photographs, you know, the extent to which images made using light and chemical processes to print uh, the trace of an object onto the surface you know, it can be said to correspond exactly to that which they signify. You know, some, some theories have elaborated on, you know, the many ways in which photographs routinely defy expectations of indexicality, uh, particularly by exceeding the intentions of the makers as they address, you know, these different audiences over space and time. Um, but there is one common exception, which is uh, the atrocity photograph. Uh, as you sort of showed in your presentation, you know, the, the status of these documentary photographs typically and chiefly derives from the assumption and the invocation of this indexicality. Um, you know, the photograph is made to bear witness, to testify to extreme violence. So my question is, what is this relationship between the concept of indexicality in photography and the use of photographs to bear witness or testify, you know, extreme violence? And how does this challenge or reinforce the notion that photographs can never fully correspond to the objects or events that they represent? Mm. Um, that's a great question, Roy, and I think it's one that um, uh, historians and photo theorists um, still struggle to answer because the two are fundamentally in tension with each other. Um, photographs have been and are used as evidence in international criminal um, uh, tribunals uh, investigating crimes against humanity and um, investigating 
um, atrocities that were committed during the Indonesian um, National Revolution. And so they are part of a suite of, um, I guess, primary sources that are used as evidence that um, these things uh, happened. And they do prompt, so when those Ritterhof photographs were published showing the summary execution, the initial response from veterans organisations in the Netherlands was, wow, this could have been a perfectly legal wartime execution. We don't really know that we're looking at something that's a, a war crime here. Um, but um, there, there, were, uh, there was a veteran who recognised themselves in one of the pictures and said, well, that's me, and I was there, and it was a summary execution. So in that sense, the photograph does index um, a thing that happened in the world. But the problem with these that perspective is that, as I've said, you know, one group of people looks in shame at these photographs now as evidence of themselves, well, as an accusation that they committed atrocities. Another group looks at those photographs and says, well, wow, but we all knew that the Dutch were dirty fighters and that it was a terrible war. Um, what we want to look at is um, the, the role that we played as heroes and um, and fighters and, and victims to liberate uh, Indonesia. But the, 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 the third perspective, of course, is the one that I talked about, which is that these images alone do not do enough in a political sense, to force recognition of um, the structures of violence and the longer histories, particularly, of violence in colonial contexts. Um, they, they don't do anything really uh, at all to foster that. For, for, for that kind of understanding, you have to look at more than those pictures. You have to understand sometimes that the photograph that you're looking of at of the taking of prisoners, for example, doesn't look like much, but that what happens several moments after that is where the real violence of the of the conflict is 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 concentrated. And of course, you know, photo theorists have long argued that you know the more you look at images of atrocity and suffering does not give you an understanding of the full scale of what happened. Um, on its own, and in fact, some people have argued that we should look away from those photographs and not continue to um, subject the people in them to um, endless indignity and suffering, that actually we should look to many other sources um, to be open to uh, learning about the full context and its historical origins um, in a more than superficial way. You cannot just understand um, um, the, the complexity of a war and all of the suffering that went along with it from looking at a few photographs. Yeah, I think um, framing and you know context really matters, you know, um, not just at looking at photographs from the time, but also uh, you know, the implications today. Um, and it's almost as if, you know, through photography. A lot of these Dutch soldiers exonerated themselves, you know, of the human rights violations that they recorded, you know, more, most often, you know, showing scenes, you know, as empathetic spectators or as humanitarian actors, uh, rather than, you know, counterinsurgents or recolonizers, um, as you have explained in your presentation, you know, they, these photographs, they visually express, you know, the official framing of the Dutch military action uh, as, you know, restorers of peace and order. And um, it's somehow feels like the narrative was encouraged by the Dutch press and uh, the military high command. So in a way, um, I'm also curious about this question on the ethics of spectatorship, right? So to what extent does the act of looking at a photograph of a victim replicate the inequalities that produced their suffering in the first instance. Yes, exactly. Um, this is a question that hangs over particularly press photography and uh, press photographers who become famous and win Pulitzer Prizes. And I mean, a lot of case, in a lot of ways, Nick Art's quite an exception because um, he was, uh, he 
stayed in contact with um, the people who he photographed in that famous terror of war um, photograph and, you know, took them to hospital. And there are famous cases of <laughs> photographers who take photographs and do very little to intervene. I mean, soldier photographers like Ron Habler, for example, who photographed the Millet massacre um, and, you know, who knew exactly what he was doing because he used his second camera. He didn't use his military camera. He used his private camera to take those photographs and then smuggled them out. But there is there are famous photographs. There's a, a one one of the famous photographs in that set. It's a group of women who are huddling together who are about to be shot, and he did nothing to intervene. And so, um, the first of all, the role of the photographer and their relationship to the subject is is one one topic that requires uh, careful interrogation. What did they do? to help or intervene. And, you know, if we're spectating on that now, um, aren't we, and and praising the photographer and making them sort of heroic, um, you know, what about the what about the ethics of uh, watching something like that um, occurring and there being no um, consequences for those photographers and quite, in fact, quite the opposite. Um, and many of the people who find themselves um, photographed in those images later went on to resent the fact that that was the one thing that they were famous for, this moment of their degradation in a lot of ways and suffering, um, and and that the public, when a photograph becomes iconic, it's like that's the whole story, and then the public loses interest in everything that happens. Um, to that individual and their whole community to reconstruct and rebuild and heal or not um, after war. So when you reduce everything to an image that captures something, you know, in an aesthetic or emotionally kind of moving way, you um, people tend to lose interest in the story. I have to say, though, I mean, it doesn't take very much research to go and look at the aftermath of the Eddie Adams and Nick Up photographs. So much has been written about them. There have been films made about those pho photographs and the the lives of of um, and the people in them. Mm -hmm. And so, I would actually encourage people if they don't want to just sort of be um, spectators who don't think about the politics of those photographs and what happened to those people and the whole historical context of the setting. Um, you can very easily go and do some um, research of your own and watch some films and there are books about um, those photographs and the people in them. And, you know, that's the way to kind of counter this very shallow um, kind of spectacular um, appreciation of press war press photography, I think. Yeah, it seems like these photographs are still very much relevant today. And I'm also kind of curious about you know these comp contemporary perspectives on um on the photographs amongst Indonesians today, as you mentioned quite interestingly. You know, uh, visual representation of these revolution era uh, deprivations were quite were made quite relevant today um, by social media users, as they you know drew a link to uh, contemporary struggles or crises like you know, the surging right prices or the shortages of uh, cooking oil caused by uh, supply disruptions uh, in the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And likewise, you know, in the Netherlands, uh, photographs like the one by Hugo Vilma uh, in your presentation, they serve as objects of uh, recognition, of contestation and mourning. Um, and for instance, um, you know, uh, Indo-European veterans in the Netherlands were amongst the first uh, in the group of first generation repatriates to achieve a kind of public platform to address uh, recent colonial past. So how would a repatriate uh, who is often already struggling to integrate back into post-war Dutch society, how would they navigate you know, uh, or address personal histories while at the same time, um, while looking at these photographs, reopen um, what seems to be, you know, the historical wounds uh, of the past. And was there a kind of backlash from the Dutch public on these uh, contestations? Mm. 
The response in the Netherlands to the research project that prompted the Ruta apology for extreme violence has been extremely polarised. So among Indo-European um, um, ad advocacy groups and political groups and cultural groups, there have been some responses that have been outraged that the Dutch government apologised first to Indonesia for Dutch soldiers having committed atrocities rather than the Dutch government having apologised to Indo-Europeans for being the victims of racism in the Netherlands <laughs> when they uh, were when they um, came there in large numbers um, during the 40s and 50s and um, ha having had their wages stolen and, um, and there's quite a lot of outrage at the research group um, having... Uh, revised down the number of casualties from a particular in intense period of fighting between um, around uh, October 1945 and March 1946 when a lot of Indo-Europeans were killed by Indonesians because of their kind of presumed historical role as collaborators with the Dutch regime because they were seen as Europeans and not as Indonesians. In the Netherlands, that period is known as the Brasil period. And um, there has been quite some consternation that 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 this that particular period of violence is now kind of being relativized and seen as similar to other periods of extreme violence. And I think this is an outcome of there being very deep wounds in Dutch society about the origins, uh, about colonialism and its legacies living in the Netherlands today and the lack of recognition for the suffering of um, people who, who were uh, not allowed to integrate as equals into Dutch society. And so there is this competition for access to public attention for grievances about the effects of colonialism. And interestingly, um, some of the Indo-European political groups who are very angry about the Ritter government's apology are kind of often in the same, <laughs> um, kind of find themselves joining Dutch veterans who are also appalled at the idea that they should be um, perpetrators. So different, different different um, political goals, but this idea of the Dutch having been um, perpetrators of violence has really scratched open wounds that have not healed um, in the Netherlands around the legacies, the living legacies of colonialism that most white Dutch people, frankly, don't want to, um, don't want to acknowledge because they prefer to see Dutch colonialism as having been something great and good, you know, building railways and lifting lifting um, so-called natives out of poverty and, and those sorts of discourses that are actually very similar in the UK and um, and and uh, yeah. it, it, other U European uh, in other European countries that have um, a history of colonialism to confront at the moment. Yeah, it seems to be a very strong focus on um, the civilizing mission of the Dutch as well. And um, I'm just also kind of curious, there is um, a bit of a connection with, um, you know, Dutch photographers, uh, between Dutch photographers in post-war Indonesia and, and those in the late 19th century, um, which you can also see in the first section of uh, Living Pictures show, uh, photographs by Kleinenberg and Co., uh, Thiele Weizenborn, you know, the latter of which really dealt with the so-called Mui Indi style. So for the earlier colonial photographs, you know, images of Indonesian landscapes, you know, evoked a kind of cartographic and aesthetic tradition of uh, uh, and a golden age um, and formulating and expressing historical claims to uh, the, the territories in the Dutch East Indies 
Uh, and there seems to be a bit of an evolution in colonial, colonial ideals and anxieties from the late 19th to early 20th century. Uh, say, early colonial photography really sought to use these tranquil landscapes to direct the viewer's attention away from colonial conquest, conflict and violence. But the images that you've shown in this presentation from the late colonial period seems quite keen to approach you know, these previously unwanted realities of indigenous resistance. So could you kind of elaborate on the evolving space of representation in the Dutch East Indies? Yeah. So what you've just outlined about the beautiful Indies um, images uh, was the subject of my first book, Images of the Tropics. And um, it was uh, part of a visual culture that sought to deflect attention away in many senses from um, the, the exploitation of natural resources, which was quite industrialised and involved the um, use of unfree labour and um, towards, you know, peaceful and, um, what's the word, um, uh, pacified landscapes that were actually, had actually recently been contested. They'd been sites of war. So, you know, these beautiful landscapes were not neutral. They were political statements um, about pacification. And um, in some ways, the, the line of continuity between that work and the work that I'm doing now is to look at the ways that a visual culture does not just function um, through the way that it repeats certain themes, but where it gets you to look. Look over here. <laughs> look over here at these pictures over here of um, um, suffering civilians and Dutch soldiers, you know, acting as humanitarians. And, oh, look at these pictures over here that we took of Indonesians committing atrocities against other Indonesians or against Indo-Europeans or Chinese Indonesians. Look over here instead. Don't look at all of these images that also exist of the Dutch committing atrocities or of Indonesians actively politically supporting the revolution. Um, so framing is one thing, but also, um, I mean, uh, um, attention, I suppose, is, is another. In the late 19th century, there were, um, in, you know, in the Dutch East Indies, there were photographs of atrocities. Um, as I mentioned in my talk, and they were kind of quite publicly celebrating um, the subjugation of, of, of the so-called outer provinces. So visual cultures can accommodate both of these things. Um, it's not as though the one always dominates. What's complex about it is trying to reconstruct the ways in which um, some things can be out in the open and there are images that exist that testify to those things having happened. But there are also lots of other images that ask us to sort of look away and look over here instead. What is it that shapes um, historical memory, historical recognition, um, the recognition of injustice and, and, and possibly even, you know, um, um, restitution? Um, those kinds of... Uh, complex historical processes that take us up to the present day often have their origins in a very diverse and complex visual culture that people can pick and choose what it is that's sort of evidence from the past, what primary sources they would like to use to uphold a particular narrative. Mm. And it comes from the full complexity of options that were available at the time and from the fact that what's amazing, what's great about photographs is they capture sometimes in one photograph, sometimes in different photographs of the same scene from different perspectives. The fact that the past was already always contested, that's the point, right, mm -hmm. is that there wasn't just one view. If you look at photographs, they show you sometimes multiple views of the same issue. And we are still fighting, <laughs> having those disagreements about which perspective is the right perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, in some ways, because they were being thought about, sometimes in a life and death struggle at the time. And so the work of historians is, is to, in some senses, recover that complexity and say it goes back to the beginning. Mm. 
um, and to try and foster an understanding of the complexity of particular issues uh, today because the past was no less complex than the present that we live in now. Um, it's, it's sometimes people in the present who seek to simplify what was going on um, at the time and kind of a selective about the kinds of images that they want to um, show to uphold those. I should warn you that the people in my house who I kicked out for this talk are just about to come in the door, <laughs> um, which might be a natural end to this presentation. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, just on the topic of, uh, not, I mean, it's great that we have uh, this conversation on Indonesia, but I also want to, uh, tie back to some of the photos that you've shared uh, on Vietnam. And we actually have an, a question from the audience. Um, Susie, you started saying that the Vietnamese diaspora views the photos uh, differently from the US. So how do they actually view it differently? Well, um, so, I mean, the photographs that you show in your exhibition are taught, taken by um, uh, photographers who are communist um, in their ideology and support not just um, a North Vietnamese communist state, but a unified Vietnam. That's the whole kind of point of the second Indochina war is to unify North and South and to make it one communist country. And um, there are parts of the South, large parts of the South that do not want to be communist and don't want to be, they want to stay um, separate and independent. And, you know, in the US kind of view of, so the North Vietnamese um, uh, photographers that, that show that kind of perspective of um, kind of infiltration and um, and resistance and, and trying to sort of forge this socialist um, future in collaboration with communists in the South. But there are many South Vietnamese for whom, you know, who were, terribly betrayed by the American and allied turnaround towards the idea that Vietnam was an unwinnable war. Um, from the South Vietnamese perspective, it was a winnable war and there were ways in which it could have been um, uh, done. And so uh, it would be very interesting to sort of, um, uh, in some ways, um, the North Vietnamese uh, photographs are, the sort of um, typical images of uh, history written by the victors, <laughs> the um, the unified uh, state, um, and it would be it would be kind of interesting to see some of the pictures of um, by South Vietnamese uh, photographers that um, are insisting on uh, a different different vision, a vision that didn't come to pass. It's, so that's another perspective that we could have covered, that I could have covered, um, that I didn't have time to cover, but it's one that exists and it's in opposition both to the North Vietnamese photographers and the American view of this as being a horrible, unwinnable war. Hmm. Yeah, mm. that's, a, that's a great perspective. And also adding to that, you know, uh, topic of um, different aspects, uh, different implications from the viewing of a photo, um, how were trophy photos circulated in private circles uh, and what kind of magazines or publications were circulating these trophy photos at the time? And did the photographers want some kind of adulation on their part and from whom? And this is a question from another member of the audience. Yeah, that's a great, that's a really great question. It goes to the question, uh, to the issue of why is it that soldiers who don't, are not, figuring themselves as witnesses, speaking to an ideal public. Why do photographs take, why do soldiers take photographs of atrocity? And I think this is a very important uh, question to weigh into. Um, sociologists are all over this question. Um, I think particularly in the digital age, in the era of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, where we know it was kind of ordinary soldiers who took photographs of atrocity that have now become iconic um, in places like Abu Ghraib, Right, and but these these kinds of photographs have a history that goes back to the mid twentieth century and even earlier. Soldiers have also always taken illicit photographs of atrocity. So why do they do that? 
One of the reasons is um, the trophy photograph celebrates war. It's what the soldiers were, if not trained well, um, to do. Then, you know, it was what they were sent out for that day and it's the better alternative to them being the ones lying there dead. So there is a longer history of a, a visual culture that celebrates killing and, and soldiering resulting in um, massacres and um, it's something that's not often talked about, that, um, that there is a visual culture of, 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 of uh, victory in war that is premised on pleasure at the suffering of others right? Um, that's actually part of the culture of, of war. It's what soldiers are trained trained to do. Um, I think sometimes when you look very closely at individual photographs, and this is what's interesting also about amateur frontline soldier photographs, is you can see that soldiers, particularly conscripts, this is one of the things that the um, Dutch war in Indonesia and the, the, the American and allied war in Vietnam have in common, is we're talking about um, soldiers being conscripted to fight against their will. It was really difficult to get out of it. Um, so sometimes those photographs are a signal of the ways that soldiers are troubled by war, um, that it's something that does uh, um, induce trauma and it starts with reflection on the things that they've witnessed and perhaps participated in. And there's lots of evidence um, that this is also happening. I mean, the first testimonies from Dutch soldiers about atrocity happened in the 1960s before all of these photographs start to come out. And so part of it has to do with um, the way that war also makes victims of perpetrators or bystanders, which is a very controversial um, topic but if you if you're a historian you have to recognize that this is sometimes part of the motivation for why these photographs or these that would seem to be fetishizing um, uh, war crimes and suffering why they also exist so it's something that you know I think historians really need to weigh in on and we need to do more work on okay I think we also have one pretty long question from the same member of the audience I think it's directed to me actually um, it says, in light of the fact that spectatorship might have widely devolved into mere seeing and not doing, uh, what is the purpose of the gallery's Living Pictures exhibition and to explore the changing roles of photography to what end? And were there any intentions by the curators to move the audience beyond a passive consumption framework and in what direction? Um, I just really want to respond by saying, you know, the mobility of the photograph really matters to and you know how they were shared, how were they, how were they distributed or exchanged, you know how they exchanged hands, you know that itself uh, makes photography unique amongst all the different art mediums that are out there. Um, mm -hmm. I actually want to introduce another contemporary work by uh, the Vietnamese uh, artist Din Kiu Le, uh, "Crossing the Father's Shore." It's one of his most significant works. It's the largest installation that the artist has ever made. And it's really the culmination of his fascination with found photographs of uh, anonymous South Vietnamese families that were taken before uh, the country's reunification in, in uh, 1975. And so Din be began collecting these photographs after his return to Vietnam in the 1990s and began incorporating them into his artwork in 2000. So this installation itself really interweaves, you know, the, the very intensely personal history on the part of the artist uh, with sometimes contentious official national histories. And it's really about these photographs in, in, in their very small scale and how they were, you know, left behind by families and eventually collected by um, secondhand shops and, you know, photo resellers, that you, you kind of see how it's not just about seeing, it's also about moving and, you know, how photographs not only uh, move, they act, they also affect the world around us. They're living, uh, as the title of the exhibition uh, tries to prove, right? So, um, you know, by showing both the front of the photographs and, you know, at the back of each photograph, there are, there are these written uh, inscriptions on the reverse. You know, the installation makes manifest uh, the circulation of these family snapshots and the status of them not only as images but almost as objects in their own right. You know, the density of both 
um, the visual and the textual uh, means that the installation really invites you know, a repeated lingering examination on the present, the past, and the future, you know, um, and it's, it is this immersiveness that, you know, goes to show the, the photograph is mobile, the image is mobile, and it is alive, right? So um, I think that's all the questions that we have at the moment. Um, and I think as much as we want to continue this, you know, very scintillating uh, conversation, I think that's all the time we have. Uh, so thank you, Susie, for sharing your insights on the visual politics of war photography in Southeast Asia. Uh, your research has really provided us with much to consider about the ethical responsibilities of both photographers and viewers. And to our audience, thank you for your attendance and engagement from wherever you are. Uh, we hope that this online lecture has been informative and that you will think more deeply about these issues as we continue to explore the power and impact of photography in the past, present, and future. So thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to continuing the conversation with you. So thank you. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.